Well here we have a standard giving set with which you're probably familiar for the administration of uh, intravenous fluids. And what we've got here is a new giving set and this means that these tubes, because it's just come out of the packet, all these tubes are going to be full of air, they're not preloaded with any fluid. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to connect up a bag of intravenous fluid. Obviously this is a simulated one because I've put it in a colour so you can see it. But that connects up to there as normal and that inserts in to the intravenous fluid bag like that. So that's now in. And what we do is we turn that upside down. Best if you have that turned off, I had it turned on. So there's a good lesson, always turn that bit off. But you can see what's happened now is that the intravenous fluid has run into the observation chamber there and it started to go through the tubing. Now as it goes through the tubing, we can watch it go through the tubing. As we go through the tubing, we notice that it drips and we notice it's starting to snake its way through the tubing. And it's very obvious with this red coloured fluid because you can see it. But as that's going along, that column of fluid is pushing the air out of the end of here. So you can't see it, but the air is now coming out of the end of this bit here. And this is called priming the system. We're priming it so that the air is coming out of here before we connect our equipment up to the patient. And we can see we're now reaching the end of this tubing here. And there we are, we've got that coming out. And if it's a fluid like saline or something, you can just run a little bit more out and you can see I'm purging these final few bubbles out now. And I'm going quite a bit of a mess with this because it's red, but now I'm going to turn that off. So what we have now, I'll just hang up my IV fluid bag. What we have now is this is completely purged. All the air is now out of this system. So when we connect this up, we're not going to be introducing air into the patient's circulation. But even though I've primed this carefully, what we actually notice, especially when we've just primed it, is there might be some very tiny air bubbles left in. Maybe we can see those very tiny air bubbles. Very small air bubbles there left in the system. Now these aren't going to do the patient any harm if they're going into a vein. So it's true to say we don't want any intravenous air whatsoever, but we don't need to be too worried about microscopic fractions of a mill of air. Now there I have my prime giving set. Now what I have here now is this is my cannula and as you can see the cannula is inserted into a vein. So here we have the intravenous cannula in situ there. Here's the vein. The cannula has been, this plastic cannula here has been introduced into the vein using a metal trocar and it's now in situ and as you see I've got it nicely secured with pieces of tape. In the clinical situation we'd want a transparent dressing on top of that as well. Now for convenience of giving injections it's nice to have one of these administration units because that means that when we've gone to give an injection our Rather than having to take the end off that, because if we do that, blood will come out. We can just use this valve here. And that fits into there. And actually when that fits into there, I don't know if you can see if it will focus, but you can see that's actually spring-loaded. That's actually spring-loaded. 
so it allows us to inject in there without having to worry about material coming back out. But if we think about it, what we're going to do is we're going to connect this piece onto the intravenous giving set, into the cannula there. But if we connect it up directly like this, if we connect it up directly, so this, this actually connects onto there, that connects up. But if we connected that now and started the fluid running, can you see that that means as the fluid goes through there, it will push that air that's in there into the patient's circulation. Now I know it's not a lot of air, but the general principle is no air at all in the circulatory system. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to prime that as well. So that's now connected up. So I'm now going to turn the drip a little bit and that's now primed that as well. Saw that run through there. Went through very quickly because it's a very small volume, but now the whole thing is primed. So when I connect up, I'm not going to be giving any intravenous air. So I'm now ready to connect this up to my intravenous catheter, which is situated there. And we can now start this drip going. And we'll see that the fluid is going through the administration set and now it's going directly into the vein. And of course, in the real situation, that will be uh, taken away in the flow of blood. I can simulate that. Yeah, taken away in the flow of blood and distributed around the body. So that's going directly in. Now, you may have noticed that there was some air in this in my demonstration. But in real life, when we cannulate, blood would come back into there and we would actually flush that through with normal isotonic saline. So that would have been full of saline. So what we can see now is we've delivered the intravenous fluid without delivering any intravenous air, which is good. So we're preventing venous air embolism. Now, venous air embolism can occur in various situations. And you can get it. This is what you actually get in decompression sickness. You know, when divers go down, and when they're under high pressure, the um, the nitrogen, when they're breathing high pressure nitrogen, the nitrogen forms an equilibrium between the pressure of the nitrogen in the blood in the lungs and the pressure of nitrogen in the blood. And when they come up, as the pressure reduces, that nitrogen changes from solution to air bubbles well, nitrogen bubbles, and you get nitrogen bubbles in the blood. That's what causes decompression sickness. You can also sometimes get air in the circulatory system with chest trauma or hyperbaric ventilation. But most times it's iatrogenic. We've accidentally introduced it because we've connected up tubing, which is full of air, which we don't want to do because when we run the fluid flu, as we've seen, that would push the air in if the system was not properly primed. Now, we don't want any air at all in the venous situation, in the venous circulation, and we particularly don't want any air at all in the arterial, uh, arterial circulation. So with arterial lines, this is even more important. So even 0.5 mils of air in a coronary artery can cause a myocardial infarction. And in cerebral arteries, two to three mils of air can cause a cerebral infarction. But if we're giving, if we did int give inadvertent intravenous air, into the circulatory system. If you think about it, where would that go? So here we have our diagram of the circulatory system. Now, if we look at the different vein systems on here, we can see that intravenous fluids will be given into the venous circulation. So for orientation here we have the left ventricle. The blood is going to go out there around the body giving up its oxygen. Then the deoxygenated blood is going to return in the systemic veins. So these are the systemic veins here. 
I know on this diagram it's labelled vena cava, but it's the smaller veins that will feed into the, uh, the vena cava. So they're the smaller veins, they're draining the body. So if we were to inadvertently give intravenous air, what would happen is that air would go through the systemic veins, through the vena cava, into the right atrium of the heart there, through to the left ventricle of the heart there, not causing too much trouble here because these chambers are quite large, but then it will go into the pulmonary artery here and start being pumped to the lungs. Now in the lungs, of course, the main pulmonary artery quickly divides into the right and left pulmonary artery, and that divides into lots of progressively smaller pulmonary vessels eventually going down into pulmonary capillaries. So if any air was accidentally introduced, what would happen actually is it would lodge in the pulmonary capillaries. And small amounts of air in the pulmonary capillaries will be fairly readily absorbed in the pulmonary capillaries and, and we don't expect it to get through the pulmonary capillaries. If it did get through the pulmonary capillaries, of course, the oxygenated, with the oxygenated blood going back in the pulmonary veins, then that would go back into the left atrium, into the left ventricle, and that's dangerous because that can go into the arterial circulation. As we said, that is particularly dangerous. Now, if there is an inadvertent venous air embolism, what clinical features might we see? Well, the patient could be short of breath because of the, what, what is it in effect, a pulmonary emboli because of the air blocking off the pulmonary capillaries. So there could be dyspnea, short of breath, and as a result, we get a tachycardia. The irritation can cause coughing, so there could be cough. If there's reduced flow of blood through the lungs, reduced flow of blood going through the lungs, that means there's reduced blood going back into the systemic circulation on this side. Therefore, there's reduced blood going out to the brain, and that can cause dizziness syncope, the patient can feel pain, faint, if they're walking there can be ataxic, slurred speech, blurred vision, things due to reduced perfusion of the brain. And that can also cause chest pain. And if there's a great reduction in the circulation, the patient gets a, a feeling of uh, impending doom, extreme anxiety. So we don't want that to happen. But of course, we always ask the question, well, how much air is safe to give intravenously? Because we did notice there were some tiny bubbles getting into the circulation anyway. And I said not to worry about those. We don't worry about tiny bubbles. So how much is safe? So here I want to demonstrate this now because I've got a, a syringe here. Nice clean needle on it. Nothing to worry about there. So I'm going to draw up uh, 10 mils of air. So now there's 10 mils of air in that. And um, if I find my, find a nice vein here. Ah, oh, yeah, there's my uh, median cubital vein in the anticubital fossa just there. You can probably see that. So what I'll do now is I'll inject 10 mils of air into my anticubital fossa and see what happens. Um, actually, I think I'll make it five. Um, go down to five mils of air. And I'll inject that into my vein and we'll see uh, what happens. So I'll in inject five mils of air. Actually, um, no, I don't think I'll do that. I think I'll, ma I think I'll make it two. Um, I'll just inject two mils uh, of air and, and we'll see what happens. I'll just find the vein now. Uh, actually, um, no, actually, I don't feel very comfortable doing this. Um, I, th I, think I, don't, I don't think it'll inject any air at all into my venous circulation, actually. Now, now forgive me for that rather um, melodramatic demonstration, but I've taught this over a couple of decades now. And you get people say, well, 10 mils of air is perfectly safe. And I say, okay, okay, 10 mils of air is perfectly safe. I get a needle and say, right, there's 10 mils of air. Roll your sleeve up. It's perfectly safe. Let's put it in. And strangely enough, in over 20 years of teaching, no one has said, oh, that's fine, you can inject 10 mils of air into me. And I know that's absolutely safe. Not that I would, of course, it's completely <laughs> quite unthinkable. But I think that shows that, would you want two mils of air in your venous circulation? I chickened out at two mils of air in my venous circulation. We don't want any really, do we? I think, I think that kind of makes the point. We don't want any 
intravenous air. Now, 20 mils of air have been inadvertently uh, administered into patients and that has caused problems. That's the length of a, an IV tubing if it's not primed. And some physiologists say that <coughs> more than 0 0.3 mils of air per kilogram of patient body weight is enough to cause clinical problems. So clearly this is much more important the smaller the person is in children. So if I weigh 70 kilograms, I don't weigh slightly more than 70 kilograms, but uh, if, if, if I weighed an ideal weight of 70 kilograms, uh, that would be 70 kilograms times 0 0.3, which means I should be able to survive if 21 mils of air went into my circulation. But of course, as we've seen, no one wants an injection of any amount of air into their um, venous circulation. So always expel all the air by fully priming all of your equipment and don't forget about the little extensions as well. Now if air was inadvertently administered and you were called to the scene then clearly you'd want to stop anything that was putting the air in and we will give the patients 100% oxygen because what happens is the air is about 80% uh, nitrogen so the oxygen would replace some of the nitrogen and the ox oxygen is absorbed more quickly by the red cells. So any air that was in the pulmonary capillaries would be absorbed more quickly if the patient was breathing 100% oxygen. And some people say we should nurse the patient in a left lateral position to get less air into the systemic circulation so if they're lying on the left side any air bubble should rise to the right side and be less likely to go into the left side of the heart that's the thinking and also we should nurse these patients in a head down position meaning that any air would sort of go up towards the uh, the feet end of the body and again be less likely to get into the venous uh, into the systemic circulation because we know air in the arterial circulation if air gets into this part of the circulation then that is remarkably dangerous. So will small bubbles of air in the systemic venous circulation kill your patient? Absolutely not, although it's more important in children. Do we want any air in the systemic venous circulation? No, we don't. If air did get in, then we can treat the patient with oxygen and position, but hopefully it won't. And we won't have this difficulty because this is actually a never event this this is the thing that should never happen air should never go into the patient's systemic circulation so don't worry about the tiny incy wincy bubbles but avoid getting all the air in that we can and in practical terms i would be very very unhappy if uh, i was given a drip in a hospital and more than half a mil of air went into my venous circulation i think we can keep it well below that but in principle, we want to avoid all air going into the circulatory system.